Welcome everyone to this lockdown edition of the madness of quantum reality. Uh, thanks for all coming along. Um, I, uh, I, I can only appreciate you as virtual participants in this uh, extravaganza who will hopefully stay with me for the next 40 or 45 minutes, not quite sure which, um, in an ambitious attempt, I think, uh, not to just explain um, some of the bizarre things that quantum mechanics has to say about the nature of reality. But uh, my main uh, ambition really is to try and explain why, why quantum mechanics has these characteristics. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a um, very quick run through of the history of physics from the turn of the 19th century onwards. I want to just establish a few principles about what mechanics is about the motions of particles and waves and how these came together in quantum mechanics. And hopefully by the end, as I say, you'll have some understanding of why quantum mechanics is as not only obscure, but as crazy as it seems. We're going to begin by taking a look at the science of mechanics at the turn of the 19th century, so around 1900. Uh, physicists in those days had really two uh, ways of looking at uh, mechanics. Mechanics is simply the science of, of motion, stuff that moves. And there were really two uh, sets of theories uh, that were really um, uh, refined by the time, um, really uh, well understood. The motions of objects, a bouncing ball, a cannonball, a grain of sand, a planet, a star, all uh, objects, material objects, were thought to be explained uh, quite adequately uh, by these mechanical laws, Newton's three laws of motion. But there was another kind of motion that required a different set of principles and a different set of uh, equations, and that's obviously the motion of waves, described by a wave equation, uh, which looks something like this. What's interesting to note about this pattern is that the wave appears to be moving from left to right, but the individual points in the wave are actually only moving up and down, as you can see if you just with your eye trace the motions of those red dots. And this kind of description was thought to apply obviously to all kinds of waves, but also including the phenomenon of light. So we had one set of equations to describe the motions of objects, and we had one set of equations to describe the motions of waves. Now, one of the reasons why um, physicists believed that um, these equations of wave motion applied to light uh, were through um, things that had been discovered in physics already uh, almost a century before. So in the early 19th century, the notion of something called two-slit interference was quite well established. This is where we take a, a, a wave, these, or is these vertical lines coming up from the left uh, are intended to give the impression of wave fronts. So imagine if you were stood on a beach and these waves were pulling in gently um, uh, onto the, uh, the, the front of the beach. Um, these waves are then forced to squeeze through two narrow or slits uh, cut in uh, and out of that, uh, because they're forced to squeeze, they, they, they undergo something called diffraction. Uh, and when they diffract, we end up with two sets of circular expanding waves, which then overlap and interfere. Um, the result, as you can see on the right, is a, is a pattern. Uh, because this is light, um, uh, what we end up with is a pattern of alternating bright and dark fringes. Uh, this is called an interference pattern. And effectively, what it means is that the waves are combining and where they overlap in a way that uh, um, gives rise to a, a big peak, that's called constructive interference, and where the waves uh, combine together both in a trough, that gives rise to a deeper trough, uh, and where they uh, coincide with peak and trough, they get cancelled out, uh, and the result is a, a dark fringe. And that was all fine. So you had one set of equations to describe the motions of objects. You had another set of equations to describe the motions of waves. Um, but then in 1905, um, depending on your point of view, you could say things started to go horribly wrong uh, when Albert Einstein uh, revealed one of nature's dirty little secrets. In a paper he published in 19, 1905, he speculated um, monochromatic radiation simply means light of, of a single color. 
blue light or green light. And he suggested it behaves as though the radiation were a discontinuous medium consisting of energy quanta. Let me translate that for you. What he's really saying is that light waves can be particles. Uh, today we know those particles as photons. So what Einstein was doing already in 1905 was saying, don't forget all about the wave description of light because we need it to explain things like diffraction and interference. There are circumstances in which it's perhaps wise or best to think of light waves in terms of, of quantum, in terms of particles, photons. Then things got messed up really seriously by one of my heroes of uh, this period of physics, um, uh, Louis de Broglie in 1923 suddenly had the idea that the discovery made by Einstein in 1905 should be generalized by extending it to all material particles and no to electrons. Electrons are those things, negatively charged particles that circulate around the nuclei of atoms. Uh, we know about electrons. Every time you plug something into the mains electricity, you get a flow of electrons which means that stuff in your kitchen works or your TV works or whatever. And we tend to think of electrons as small contained objects. We can't really picture them very well because they're very, very small and we can't see them. But we tend to think of them as small bundles, bits of charged matter, electrically charged matter. Uh, but what de Broglie was saying in 1923 is actually, hang on, maybe electrons can be waves. And this is one depiction here of an electron wave formed around the nucleus of an atom. Well, this is all starting to get a little bit bizarre. Um, uh, it begs all sorts of difficult questions. So, for example, if we can see light diffraction and interference in a two-slip experiment, and if, as de Broglie suggests, electron wave, then um, can we do the two-slit experiment with electrons? And, and what then happens if we do the experiment where we pass the electrons through the two slits one at a time? Now, over on the left of this picture, um, older viewers uh, will know that in the early days of TV, um, TVs worked by having a cathode ray gun. Uh, at the back of the set, which would produce a beam of electrons, cathode rays, as they were uh, known in the early days, which would spray over a phosphor screen and the image would be translated into pointing the electrons in different places on the screen uh, to, to form and shape an image. But we can take that electron gun, that cathode ray gun, and use it as a source of uh, electrons in an electron beam. But we turn the intensity of that beam down such that on average there's only one electron passing through the two slits at a time. What, what would we expect to see? Now, logic would suggest that if these electrons really are tiny little bits of uh, charged material substance, then uh, the electron goes through one or the other of the two slits and we end up with two bright lines forming on the screen beyond. Uh, these are shown here by the blue curves. We form one peak on the left and one peak on the right. But if electrons really are like waves, then we might expect something different. Uh, maybe something that looks like the brown curve in this particular picture, which is the interference pattern. Now, before we start asking ourselves disturbing questions about how we could expect an electron to be forming an interference pattern all by itself. Let's just have a, a look at uh, to see uh, what actually happens. And this is what I tend to think of as the essential mystery of quantum mechanics. So here's what happens. We begin the process, we start to observe, and this is kind of reassuring. We see little points of light where the electrons are striking the screen. And as more and more electrons come through, uh, we start to see these uh, seem to be scattering randomly. But by the time we're done, now it's not very high resolution, but you can begin to see that what we certainly don't see is two lines or groups where the electrons have gone through either one slit or the other. What we have here is an interference pattern. So even though the electrons are passing through the two slits one at a time, on average, 
uh, we still get an interference pattern. And that's fundamentally disturbing. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.